Chapter Twenty Three of the Ontario Readers Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ontario Readers Fourth Book by Various The Crusader and the Saracen as the knight of the couchant leopard continued to fix his eyes attentively on the yet distant cluster of palm trees it seemed to him as if some object was moving among them the distant form separated itself from the trees which partly hid its motions and advanced towards the knight with a speed which soon showed a mounted horseman whom his turban, long spear, and green caftan floating in the wind on his nearer approach, showed to be a Saracen cavalier. In the desert, saith an eastern proverb, no man meets a friend. The crusader was totally indifferent whether the infidel, who now approached on his gallant barb, as if borne on the wings of an eagle, came as friend or foe. Perhaps, as a vowed champion of the cross, he might rather have preferred the latter. He disengaged his lance from his saddle, seized it with the right hand, placed it in rest with its point half elevated, gathered up the reins in the left, waked his horse's metal with the spur, and prepared to encounter the stranger with a calm self-confidence belonging to the victor in many contests. The Saracen came on at the speedy gallop of an Arab horseman, managing his steed more by his limbs and the inflection of his body than by any use of the reins, which hung loose in his left hand, so that he was enabled to wield the light round buckler of the skin of the rhinoceros ornamented with silver loops which he wore on his arm swinging it as if he meant to oppose its slender circle to the formidable thrust of the western lance his own long spear was not couched or levelled like that of his antagonist but grasped by the middle with his right hand and brandished at arm's length above his head as the cavalier approached his enemy at full career he seemed to expect that the knight of the leopard should put his horse to the gallop to encounter him but the christian knight well acquainted with the customs of eastern warriors did not mean to exhaust his good horse by any unnecessary exertion and on the contrary made a dead halt confident that if the enemy advanced to the actual shock his own weight and that of his powerful charger would give him sufficient advantage without the additional momentum of rapid motion equally sensible and apprehensive of such a probable result the saracen cavalier when he had approached towards the christian within twice the length of his lance wheeled his steed to the left with inimitable dexterity and rode twice around his antagonist who turning without quitting his ground and presenting his front constantly to his enemy frustrated his attempts to attack him on an unguarded point so that the saracen wheeling his horse was fain to retreat to the distance of a hundred yards a second time like a hawk attacking a heron the heathen renewed the charge and a second time was fain to retreat without coming to a close struggle a third time he approached in the same manner when the christian knight desirous to terminate this illusory warfare 
in which he might at length have been worn out by the activity of his foeman suddenly seized the mace which hung at his saddle-bow and with a strong hand and unerring aim hurled it against the head of the emir for such and not less his enemy appeared the saracen was just aware of the formidable missile in time to interpose his light buckler betwixt the mace and his head but the violence of the blow forced the buckler down on his turban and though that defence also contributed to deaden its violence the saracen was beaten from his horse ere the christian could avail himself of this mishap his nimble foeman sprang from the ground and calling on his steed which instantly returned to his side he leapt into his seat without touching the stirrup and regained all the advantage of which the knight of the leopard hoped to deprive him but the latter had in the meanwhile recovered his mace and the eastern cavalier who remembered the strength and dexterity with which his antagonists had aimed it seemed to keep cautiously out of the reach of that weapon of which he had so lately felt the force while he showed his purpose of waging a distant warfare with missile weapons of his own planting his long spear in the sand at a distance from the scene of combat he strung with great address a short bow which he carried at his back and putting his horse to the gallop once more described two or three circles of a wider extent than formerly in the course of which he discharged six arrows at the christian with such unerring skill that the goodness of his harness alone saved him from being wounded in as many places the seventh shaft apparently found a less perfect part of the armour and the christian dropped heavily from his horse but what was the surprise of the saracen when dismounting to examine the condition of his prostrate enemy he found himself suddenly within the grasp of the european who had had recourse to this artifice to bring his enemy within his reach even in this deadly grapple the saracen was saved by his agility and presence of mind he unloosed the sword belt in which the knight of the leopard had fixed his hold and thus eluding his fatal grasp mounted his horse which seemed to watch his motions with the intelligence of a human being and again rode off but in the last encounter the saracen had lost his sword and his quiver of arrows both of which were attached to the girdle which he was obliged to abandon he had also lost his turban in the struggle these disadvantages seemed to incline the muslim to a truce he approached the christian with his right hand extended but no longer in a menacing attitude there is a truce betwixt our nations he said in the lingua franca commonly used for the purpose of communication with the crusaders wherefore should there be war betwixt thee and me let there be peace betwixt us i am well contented answered he of the couchant leopard but what security dost thou offer that thou wilt observe the truce the word of a follower of the prophet was never broken answered the emir it is thou brave nazarene from whom i should demand security did i not know that treason seldom dwells with courage the crusader felt that the confidence of the muslim made him ashamed of his own doubts by the cross of my sword he said laying his hand on the weapon as he spoke i will be true companion to thee saracen 
while our fortune wills that we remain in company together by muhammad prophet of god and by allah god of the prophet replied his late foeman there is not treachery in my heart towards thee and now wend we to yonder fountain for the hour of rest is at hand and the stream had hardly touched my lip when i was called to battle by thy approach the knight of the couchant leopard yielded a ready and courteous assent and the late foes without an angry look or gesture of doubt rode side by side to the little cluster of palm trees by scott from the talisman the quality of mercy is not strained it droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath it is twice blessed it blesseth him that gives and him that takes tis mightiest in the mightiest it becomes the throned monarch better than his crown his sceptre shows the force of temporal power the attribute to awe and majesty wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings but mercy is above this sceptred sway it is enthroned in the hearts of kings it is an attribute to god himself and earthly power doth then shew like us gods when mercy seasons justice by shakespeare end of chapter 23chapter 24 of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox.org by melissa perry from an august reverie the ragged daisy starring all the fields the buttercup a brim with pallid gold the thistle and burr flowers hedged with prickly shields all common weeds the draggled pastures hold with shriveled pods and leaves are kin to me like heirs of earth and her maturity they speak a silenced speech that is their own these wise and gentle teachers of the grass and when their brief and common days are flown a certain beauty from the year doth pass a beauty of whose light no eye can tell save that it went and my heart knew it well i may not know each plant as some men know them as children gather beasts and birds to tame but i went mid them as the winds that blow them from childhood's hour and loved without a name there is more beauty in a field of weeds than in all blooms the hothouse garden breeds for they are nature's children in their faces i see that sweet obedience to the sky that marks these dwellers of the wilding places who with the season's being live and die knowing no love but of the wind and sun who still are nature's when their life is done they are a part of all the haze-filled hours the happy happy world all drenched with light the far-off chiming click-clack of the mowers and yon blue hills whose mists elude my sight and they to me will ever bring in dreams far mist-clad heights and brimming rain-fed streams w wilfred campbell end of chapter twenty four this recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox dot org by betty b work and wages there will always be a number of men who would fain set themselves to the accumulation of wealth as the sole object of their lives necessarily that class of men is an uneducated class inferior in intellect and more or less cowardly it is physically impossible for a well-educated intellectual or brave man to make money the chief object of his thoughts just as it is for him to make his dinner the principal object of them all healthy people like their dinners 
but their dinner is not the main object of their lives so all healthily minded people like making money ought to like it and to enjoy the sensation of winning it but the main object of their life is not money it is something better than money a good soldier for instance mainly wishes to do his fighting well he is glad of his pay very properly so and justly grumbles when you keep him ten years without it still his main notion of life is to win battles not to be paid for winning them so of clergymen they like pew rents and baptismal fees of course but yet if they are brave and well educated the pew rent is not the sole object of their lives and the baptismal fee is not the sole purpose of the baptism the clergyman's object is essentially to baptize and preach not to be paid for preaching so of doctors they like fees no doubt ought to like them yet if they are brave and well educated the entire object of their lives is not fees they on the whole desire to cure the sick and if they are good doctors and the choice were fairly put to them would rather cure their patient and lose their fee than kill him and get it and so with all other brave and rightly trained men their work is first their fee second very important always but still second but in every nation as i said there are a vast class who are ill-educated cowardly and more or less stupid and with these people just as certainly the fee is first and the work second as with brave people the work is first and the fee second and this is no small distinction it is the whole distinction in a man distinction between life and death in him between heaven and hell for him you cannot serve two masters you must serve one or other if your work is first with you and your fee second work is your master and the lord of work who is god but if your fee is first with you and your work second fee is your master and the lord of fee who is the devil and not only the devil but the lowest of devils the least erected fiend that fell so there you have it in brief terms work first you are god's servants fee first you are the fiends and it makes a difference now and ever believe me whether you serve him who has on his vesture and thigh written king of kings and whose service is perfect freedom or him on whose vesture and thigh the name is written slave of slaves and whose service is perfect slavery ruskin end of chapter twenty five this recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox dot org by alethea untrodden ways where close the curving mountains drew to clasp the stream in their embrace with every outline curve and hue reflected in its placid face the ploughman stopped his team to watch the train as swift it thundered by some distant glimpse of life to catch he strains his eager wistful eye his glossy horses mildly stand with wonder in their patient eyes as through the tranquil mountain land the snorting monster onward flies the morning freshness is on him just wakened from his balmy dreams the wayfarers all soiled and dim think longingly of mountain streams oh for the joyous mountain air the long delightful autumn day among the hills the ploughman there must have perpetual holiday and he as all day long he guides his steady plough with patient hand thinks of the flying train that glides into some fair enchanted land where day by day no plodding round wearies the frame and dulls the mind where life thrills keen to sight and sound with plough and furrows left behind even so to each the untrod ways of life are touched by fancy's glow that ever sheds its brightest rays 
upon the page we do not know. End of chapter 26. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 of The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Alethea. The First Ploughing. Calls the crow from the pine tree top when the April air is still. He calls to the farmer hitching his team in the farmyard under the hill. Come up, he cries, come out and come up, for the high field's ripe to till. Don't wait for word from the dandelion or leave from the daffodil. Cheeps the flycatcher. Here old earth warms up in the April sun, and the first ephemera wings yet wet from the mold creep one by one. Under the fence, where the flies frequent, is the earliest gossamer spun. Come up from the damp of the valley lands, for here the winter's done. Whistles the high hole out of the grove, his summoning loud and clear. Chilly it may be down your way, but the high south field has cheer. On the sunward side of the chestnut stump, the wood grubs wake and appear. Come out to your ploughing, come up to your ploughing, the time for ploughing is here. Then dips the coulter and drives the share, and the furrows faintly steam. The crow drifts furtively down from the pine to follow the clanking team. The flycatcher tumbles, the high hole darts, and the young noon's yellow gleam. And wholesome sweet, the smell of the sod, upturned from its winter's dream. Charles G. D. Roberts End of chapter 27 This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 of the Ontario Readers Fourth Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book, by Various. Chapter 28 The Archery Contest. The day, said Waldemar, is not yet very far spent. Let the archers shoot a few rounds at the target, and the prize be adjudged. One by one, the archers, stepping forward, delivered their shafts, yeoman like and bravely. Of the ten shafts which hit the target, two within the inner ring were shot by Hubert, a forester in the service of Malvoisin, who was accordingly pronounced victorious. Now, Loxley, said Prince John, with a bitter smile, wilt thou try conclusions with Hubert? Sith it be no better, said Loxley, I am content to try my fortune on condition that when i have shot two shafts at yonder mark of hubert's he shall be bound to shoot one at that which i shall propose that is but fair answered prince john and it shall not be refused thee if thou dost beat this braggart hubert i will fill the bugle with silver pennies for thee a man can but do his best answered hubert but my grandsire drew a good long bow at Hastings, and I trust not to dishonour his memory. The former target was now removed, and a fresh one of the same size placed in its room. Hubert took his aim with great deliberation, long measuring the distance with his eye, while he held in his hand his bended bow, with the arrow placed on the string. At length he made a step forward, and raising the bow at the full stretch of his left arm till the centre or grasping place was nigh level with his face he drew his bowstring to his ear the arrow whistled through the air and lighted within the inner ring of the target but not exactly in the centre you have not allowed for the wind hubert said his antagonist bending his bow or that had been a better shot so saying and without showing the least anxiety to pause upon his aim, Loxley stepped to the appointed station and shot his arrow as carelessly in appearance as if he had not even looked at the mark. 
he was speaking almost at the same instant that the shaft left the bowstring yet it alighted in the target two inches nearer to the white spot which marked the centre than that of hubert by the light of heaven said prince john to hubert and thou suffer that runagate knave to overcome thee thou art worthy of the gallows and your highness were to hang me said hubert a man can but do his best nevertheless my grandsire drew a good bow the foul fiend on thy grandsire and all his generation interrupted john shoot knave and shoot thy best or it shall be the worst for thee thus exhorted hubert resumed his place and making the necessary allowance for a very light air of wind which had just arisen shot so successfully that his arrow alighted in the very centre of the target thou canst not mend that shot locksley said the prince with an insulting smile i will notch his shaft for him however replied locksley and letting fly his arrow with a little more precaution than before it lighted right upon that of his competitor which it split to shivers and now said locksley i will crave your grace's permission to plant such a mark as is used in the north country and welcome every brave yeoman who shall try a shot at it he then turned to leave the lists let your guards attend me he said if you please i go but to cut a rod from the next willow bush locksley returned almost instantly with a willow wand about six feet in length perfectly straight and rather thicker than a man's thumb he began to peel this observing that to ask a good woodman to shoot at a target so broad as had hitherto been used was to put shame upon his skill for my own part he said and in the land where i was bred men would as soon take for their mark king arthur's round table which held sixty knights around it a child of seven years old he said might hit yonder target with a headless shaft but added he walking deliberately to the other end of the lists and sticking the willow wand upright in the ground he that hits that rod at five score yards i call him an archer fit to bear bow and quiver before a king my grandsire said hubert drew a good bow at the battle of hastings and never shot at such a mark in his life and neither will i if this yeoman can cleave that rod i give him the bucklers or rather i yield to the devil that is in his jerkin and not to any human skill a man can but do his best and i will not shoot where i am sure to miss i might as well shoot at a sunbeam as at a twinkling white streak which i can hardly see cowardly dog said prince john sirrah locksley do thou shoot but if thou hittest such a mark i will say thou art the first man ever did so howe'er it be thou shalt not crow over us with a mere show of superior skill i will do my best as hubert says answered locksley no man can do more so saying he again bent his bow but on the present occasion looked with attention to his weapon and changed the string which he thought was no longer truly round having been a little frayed by the two former shots he then took his aim with some deliberation and the multitude awaited the event in breathless silence the archer vindicated their opinion of his skill his arrow split the willow rod against which it was aimed a jubilee of acclamations followed and even prince john in admiration of locksley's skill lost for an instant his dislike to his person these twenty nobles he said which with the bugle thou hast fairly won are thine own we will make them fifty if thou wilt take livery and service with us as a yeoman of our bodyguard and be near to our person for never did so strong a hand bend a bow or so true an eye direct a shaft pardon me noble prince said locksley but i have vowed that if ever i take service it should be with your royal brother king richard 
these twenty nobles i leave to hubert who has this day drawn as brave a bow as his grandsire did at hastings had his modesty not refused the trial he would have hit the wand as well as i hubert shook his head as he received with reluctance the bounty of the stranger and locksley anxious to escape further observation mixed with the crowd and was seen no more scott ivanhoe end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox dot org by alethea in november the hills and leafless forests slowly yield to the thick driving snow a little while and night shall darken down in shouting file the woodman's carts go by me homeward wheeled past the thin fading stubbles half concealed now golden gray sowed softly through with snow where the last ploughman follows still his row turning black furrows through the whitening field archibald lampman end of chapter twenty nine this recording is in the public domain chapter thirty of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox dot org by anne fletcher autumn woods by william cullen bryant ere in the northern gale the summer tresses of the trees are gone the woods of autumn all around our vale have put their glory on the mountains that enfold in their wide sweep the coloured landscape round seem groups of giant kings in purple and gold that guard the enchanted ground i roam the woods that crown the upland where the mingled splendours glow where the gay company of trees look down on the green fields below my steps are not alone in these bright walks the sweet south-west at play flies rustling where the painted leaves are strown along the winding way and far in heaven the while the sun that sends that gale to wander here pours out on the fair earth his quiet smile the sweetest of the year where now the solemn shade verdure and gloom where many branches meet so grateful when the noon of summer made the valleys sick with heat let in through all the trees come the strange rays the forest depths are bright their sunny coloured foliage in the breeze twinkles like beams of light the rivulet late unseen where bickering through the shrubs its waters run shines with the image of its golden screen and glimmerings of the sun o oh, autumn why so soon depart the hues that make thy forest glad thy gentle wind and thy fair sunny noon and leave thee wild and sad oh twere a lot too blest for ever in thy coloured shades to stray amid the kisses of the soft south-west to rove and dream for a and leave the vain low strife that makes men mad the tug for wealth and power the passions and the cares that wither life and waste its little hour end of chapter thirty this recording is in the public domain Section 31 of The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Voice Before the Void On the North Dakota Saskatchewan Border the voice before the void dot net in a canoe among all the modes of progression hitherto invented by restless man 
there is not one that can compare in respect of comfort and luxury with traveling in a birch bark canoe. It is the poetry of progression. Along the bottom of the boat are laid blankets and bedding. A sort of wickerwork screen is sloped against the middle thwart, affording a delicious support to the back. And, indolently, in your shirt sleeves if the day be warm, or well covered with a blanket if it is chilly, you sit or lie on this most luxurious of couches, and are propelled at a rapid rate over the smooth surface of a lake or down the swift current of some stream. If you want exercise, you can take a paddle yourself. If you prefer to be inactive, you can lie still and placidly survey the scenery, rising occasionally to have a shot at a wild duck, at intervals reading, smoking, and sleeping. Sleep, indeed, you will enjoy most luxuriously, for the rapid bounding motion of the canoe as it leaps forward at every impulse of the crew, the sharp, quick beat of the paddles on the water, and the roll of their shafts against the gunwale, with the continuous hiss and ripple of the stream cleft by the curving prow, combine to make a most soothing soporific. Dreamily you lie side by side, you and your friend, lazily gazing at the pine-covered shores and wooded islands of some unknown lake, the open book unheeded on your knee, the half-smoked pipe drops into your lap, your head sinks gently back, and you wander into dreamland, to awake presently and find yourself sweeping round the curve of some majestic river, whose shores are blazing with the rich crimson, brown, and gold of the maple and other hardwood trees in their autumn dress. Presently, the current quickens. The best man shifts his place from the stern to the bow, and stands ready with his long-handled paddle to twist the frail boat out of reach of hidden rocks. The men's faces glow with excitement. Quicker and quicker flows the stream, breaking into little rapids, foaming round rocks, and rising in tumbling waves over the shallows. At a word from the bowmen, the crew redouble their efforts. The paddle shafts crash against the gunwale. The spray flies beneath the bending blades. The canoe shakes and quivers through all its fibers, leaping bodily at every stroke. Before you is a seething mass of foam, its whiteness broken by horrid black rocks, one touch against whose jagged sides would rip the canoe into tatters and hurl you into eternity. Your ears are full of the roar of waters, Waves leap up in all directions, as the river, maddened at obstruction, hurls itself through some narrow gorge. The bowman stands erect to take one look in silence, noting in that critical instant the line of deepest water. Then, bending to his work, with sharp, short words of command to the steersman, he directs the boat. The canoe seems to pitch headlong into space. Whack! comes a great wave over the bow. Crash! comes another over the side. The bowman, his figure stooped and his knees planted firmly against the sides, stands with paddle poised in both hands, screaming to the crew to paddle hard, and the crew cheer and shout with excitement in return. You, too, get wild and feel inclined to yell defiance to the roaring, hissing flood that madly dashes you from side to side. After the first plunge, you are in a bewildering whirl of waters. The shore seems to fly past you. Crash! You are right on that rock. And, I don't care who you are, you will feel your heart jump into your mouth. And you will catch the side with a grip that leaves a mark on your fingers afterwards. No! With a shriek of command to the steersman and a plunge of his paddle, the bowman wrenches the canoe out of its course. Another stroke or two, another plunge forward and with a loud, exulting yell from the bowman, who flourishes his paddle round his head, you pitch headlong down the final leap. 
and with a grunt of relief from the straining crew, glide rapidly into still water. Lord Dunraven, The Great Divide With whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. It fortifies my soul to know that, though I perish, truth is so. That, howsoe'er I stray and range, whate'er I do, thou dost not change. I steady your step when I recall that, if I slip, thou dost not fall. Arthur Hugh Clough End of Section 31 Recording by The Voice Before the Void Chapter 32 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Anne Fletcher Afton Water by Robert Burns Flow gently, sweet Afton, among thy green braes. Flow gently, I'll sing thee a song in thy praise. My Mary's asleep by thy murmuring stream. Flow gently, sweet Afton, disturb not her dream. Thou stockdove, whose echo resounds through the glen, Ye wild whistling blackbirds in yon thorny den, Thou green-crested lapwing, thy screaming forbear, I charge you, disturb not my slumbering fair. How lofty, sweet Afton, thy neighbouring hills, Far marked with the courses of clear winding rills, There daily I wander as noon rises high, My flocks and my Mary's sweet cot in my eye. How pleasant thy banks and green valleys below, where wild in the woodland the primroses blow. There, oft as mild evening weeps over the lea, the sweet-scented birk shades my Mary and me. Thy crystal stream, Afton, how lovely it glides and winds by the cot where my Mary resides. How wanton thy waters her snowy feet lave, as gathering sweet flowerets she stems thy clear wave. Flow gently, sweet Afton, among thy green braes. Flow gently, sweet river, the theme of my lays. My Mary's asleep by thy murmuring stream. Flow gently, sweet Afton, disturb not her dream. End of chapter 32 This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 33 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Ontario Reader's Fourth Book by Various. Chapter 33 David Copperfield's First Journey Alone. I slept soundly until we got to Yarmouth and drove to the inn-yard. A lady looked out of a bow-window where some fowls and joints of meat were hanging up and said, Is that the little gentleman from Blunderstone? Yes, ma'am, I said. The lady then rang a bell and called out, William, show the coffee-room. Upon which a waiter came running out of a kitchen on the opposite side of the yard to show it and seemed a good deal surprised when he found he was only to show it to me. It was a large, long room with some large maps in it. I doubt if I could have felt much stranger if the maps had been real foreign countries, and I cast away in the middle of them. I felt it was taking a liberty to sit down, with my cap in my hand, on the corner of the chair nearest the door, and when the waiter laid a cloth on purpose for me, 
and put a set of casters on it, I think I must have turned red all over with modesty. He brought me some chops and vegetables, and took the covers off in such a bouncing manner that I was afraid I must have given him some offense. But he greatly relieved my mind by putting a chair for me at the table and saying, very affably, Now, six foot, come on. I thanked him and took my seat at the board, but found it extremely difficult to handle my knife and fork with anything like dexterity, or to avoid splashing myself with the gravy while he was standing opposite staring so hard and making me blush in the most dreadful manner every time I caught his eye. After watching me into the second chop, he said, "'There's half a pint of ale for you. Will you have it now?' I thanked him and said yes upon which he poured it out of a jug into a large tumbler and held it up against the light and made it look beautiful my eye he said it seems a good deal don't it it does seem a good deal i answered with a smile for it was quite delightful to me to find him so pleasant he was a twinkling-eyed pimple-faced man with his hair standing upright all over his head and as he stood with one arm akimbo holding up the glass to the light with the other hand he looked quite friendly. "'There was a gentleman here yesterday,' he said, "'a stout gentleman, by the name of Top Sawyer. Perhaps you know him.' "'No,' I said. "'I don't think. In breeches and gaiters, broad-brimmed hat, gray coat, speckled choker,' said the waiter. "'No,' I said bashfully. "'I haven't the pleasure.' He came in here, said the waiter, looking at the light through the tumbler, ordered a glass of this ale, would order it, I told him not, drank it, and fell dead. It was too old for him. It oughtn't to be drawn. That's the fact. I was very much shocked to hear of this melancholy accident, and said I thought I had better have some water. Why, you see, said the waiter, still looking at the light through the tumbler, with one of his eyes shut up. Our people don't like things being ordered and left. It offends them. But I'll drink it, if you like. I'm used to it, and use is everything. I don't think it'll hurt me if I throw my head back and take it off quick. Shall I? I replied that he would much oblige me by drinking it if he thought he could do it safely, but by no means otherwise. When he did throw his head back and take it off quick, I had a horrible fear, I confess, of seeing him meet the fate of the lamented Mr. Topsawyer and fall lifeless on the carpet. But it didn't hurt him. On the contrary, I thought he seemed the fresher for it. What have you got there? he said, putting a fork into my dish. Not chops. Chops, I said. Bless my soul, he exclaimed. I didn't know they were chops. Why, a chop's the very thing to take off the bad effects of that beer. Ain't it lucky? So he took a chop by the bone in one hand, and a potato in the other, and ate away with a very good appetite, to my extreme satisfaction. He afterwards took another chop, and another potato, and after that another chop and another potato. When he had done, he brought me a pudding, and having set it before me, seemed to ruminate and to become absent in his mind for some moments. "'How's the pie?' he said, rousing himself. "'It's a pudding,' I made answer. "'Pudding?' he exclaimed. "'Why, bless me, so it is, what?' looking at it nearer. "'You don't mean to say it's a batter pudding?' "'Yes, it is, indeed.' "'Why, a batter pudding,' he said, taking up a tablespoon. "'It's my favorite pudding.' Ain't that lucky? Come on, little un, and let's see who'll get most. The waiter certainly got most. He entreated me more than once to come in and win. But what with his tablespoon to my teaspoon, his dispatch to my dispatch, and his appetite to my appetite, I was left far behind at the first mouthful, and had no chance with him. I never saw anyone enjoy a pudding so much, I think and he laughed when it was all gone, as if his enjoyment of it lasted still. Finding him so very friendly and companionable, it was then that I asked for the pen and ink and paper to write to Peggotty. He not only brought it immediately, but was good enough to look over me while I wrote the letter. 
when I had finished it, he asked me where I was going to school. I said, near London, which was all I knew. Oh, my eye, he said, looking very low-spirited. I am sorry for that. Why? I asked him. Oh, he said, shaking his head. That's the school where they broke the boy's ribs. Two ribs. A little boy he was. I should say he was... Let me see. How old are you about? I told him between eight and nine. That's just his age, he said. He was eight years and six months old when they broke his first rib. Eight years and eight months old when they broke his second and did for him. I could not disguise from myself or from the waiter that this was an uncomfortable coincidence, and inquired how it was done. His answer was not cheering to my spirits, for it consisted of two dismal words with whopping. The blowing of the coach horn in the yard was a seasonable diversion, which made me get up and hesitatingly inquire, in the mingled pride and diffidence of having a purse, which I took out of my pocket, if there were anything to pay. There is a sheet of letter paper, he returned. Did you ever buy a sheet of letter paper? I could not remember that I ever had. It's dear, he said, on account of the duty. Three pence. That's the way we're taxed in this country. There's nothing else except the waiter. Never mind the ink. I lose by that. What should you, what should I, how much ought I to, what would it be right to pay the waiter, if you please? I stammered, blushing. If I hadn't a family, and that family hadn't the cowpock, said the waiter, I wouldn't take a sixpence. If I didn't support an aged parent and a lovely sister, here the waiter was greatly agitated, I wouldn't take a farthing. If I had a good place and was treated well here, I should beg acceptance of a trifle instead of taking of it but I live on broken whittles, and I sleep on the coals. Here the waiter burst into tears. I was very much concerned for his misfortunes, and felt that any recognition short of nine pence would be mere brutality and hardness of heart. Therefore I gave him one of my three bright shillings, which he received with much humility and veneration, and spun up with his thumb directly afterwards to try the goodness of. It was a little disconcerting to me to find when I was being helped up behind the coach that I was supposed to have eaten all the dinner without any assistance. I discovered this from overhearing the lady in the bow window say to the guard, Take care of that child, George, or he'll burst, and from observing that the women servants who were about the place came out to look and giggle at me as a young phenomenon. My unfortunate friend the waiter, who had quite recovered his spirits, did not appear to be disturbed by this, but joined in the general admiration without being at all confused. If I had any doubt of him, I suppose this half awakened it, but I am inclined to believe that with the simple confidence and natural reliance of a child upon superior years, qualities I am very sorry any children should prematurely change for worldly wisdom, I had no serious mistrust of him on the whole, even then. End of chapter 33. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Chapter 34 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellery Davidson. The Barefoot Boy. Blessings on thee, little man, barefoot boy with cheek of tan, with thy turned up pantaloons and thy merry whistled tunes, with thy red lip, redder still, kissed by strawberries on the hill, with the sunshine on thy face, through thy torn brim's jaunty grace. From my heart I give thee joy. I was once a barefoot boy. Prince thou art, the grown-up man, only as Republican. Let the million-dollared ride. Barefoot trudging at his side, thou hast more than he can buy, in the reach of ear and eye. Outward sunshine, inward joy, blessings on thee, barefoot boy. 
O oh, for boyhood's painless play, sleep that wakes in laughing day, health that mocks the doctor's rules, knowledge never learned of schools, of the wild bee's morning chase, of the wild flower's time and place, flight of fowl and habitude of the tenants of the wood, how the tortoise bears his shell, how the woodchuck digs his cell, and the ground mole sinks his well, how the robin feeds her young, how the oriole's nest is hung, where the whitest lilies blow, where the freshest berries grow, where the ground nut trails its vine, where the wood grapes clusters shine, of the black wasp's cunning way, mason of his walls of clay, and the architectural plans of gray hornet artisans, for skewing books and tasks, nature answers all he asks, hand in hand with her he walks, face to face with her he talks part and parcel of her joy blessings on the barefoot boy oh for boyhood's time of june crowding years in one brief moon when all things i heard or saw me their master waited for i was rich in flowers and trees hummingbirds and honey-bees for my sport the squirrel played plied the snouted mole his spade for my taste the blackberry cone purpled over hedge and stone laughed the brook for my delight through the day and through the night whispering at the garden wall talked with me from fall to fall mine the sand-rimmed pickerel pond mine the walnut slopes beyond mine on bending orchard trees apples of hesperides still as my horizon grew larger grew my riches too all the world i saw or knew seemed a complex chinese toy fashioned for a barefoot boy oh for festal dainties spread like my bowl of milk and bread pewter spoon and bowl of wood on the doorstone gray and rude o'er me like a regal tent cloudy ribbed the sunset bent purple curtained fringed with gold looped in many a wind-swung fold while for music came the play of the pied frog's orchestra and to light the noisy choir lit the fly his lamp of fire i was monarch pomp and joy waited on the barefoot boy cheerily then my little man live and laugh as boyhood can though the flinty slopes be hard stubble speared the new mown sward Every morn shall lead thee through fresh baptisms of the dew. Every evening from thy feet shall the cool wind kiss the heat. All too soon these feet must hide in the prison cells of pride. Lose the freedom of the sod, like a colt's for work be shod. Made to tread the mills of toil, up and down in ceaseless moil. Happy if their track be found never on forbidden ground, Happy if they sink not in quick and treacherous sands of sin. Ah, that thou couldst know thy joy ere it passes, barefoot boy. End of chapter 34。Chapter 35 of The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book by Various. Country Life in Canada in the Thirties. Country life in Western Canada in the Thirties was very simple and uneventful. There were no lines of social division such as now exist. All alike had to toil to win and maintain a home and if as was natural some were more successful in the rough battle of pioneer life than others they did not feel on that account disposed to treat their neighbors as their inferiors neighbors they well knew were too few and too desirable to be coldly and haughtily treated had not all the members of each community hewn their way side by side into the fastnesses of the canadian bush and what could a little additional wealth do for them when the remoteness of the centres which might supply luxuries enforced simplicity and made superfluities almost impossible the furnishings of their houses were plain and the chief articles of dress 
if substantial and comfortable were of course homespun the product of their own labor the sources of amusement were limited the day of the harmonium or piano had not come music except in its simplest vocal form was not cultivated only the occasional presence of some fiddler afforded rare seasons of merriment to the delight both of old and young the motto of early to bed and early to rise was even in winter the strict rule of family life in the morning all were up and breakfast was over usually before seven as soon as the gray light of dawn appeared men and boys were off to the barns not merely to feed the cattle but to engage in the needful and tedious labor of threshing by hand in the evenings the family gathered together for lighter tasks and pleasant talk around a glowing fire in firewood at least there was in those days no need for economy we scarcely realize how largely little things may contribute to convenience and comfort there were no lucifer matches at that date it was needful to cover up carefully the live coals on the hearth before going to bed so that there might be the means of starting the fire in the morning this precaution was rarely unsuccessful but sometimes a member of the family had to set out for a supply of fire from a neighbor's in order that breakfast might be prepared i remember well having to crawl out of my warm nest and run through the keen frosty air for half a mile or more to fetch live coals from a neighbor's it was however my father's practice to keep bundles of finely split pine sticks tipped with brimstone with the aid of these the merest spark served to start the fire in the spring tasks of various kinds crowded rapidly upon us the hams and beef that had been salted down in casks during the preceding autumn were taken out of the brine washed off and hung in the smokehouse on the earthen floor beech or maple was burned the oily smoke given off by the combustion of these woods in a confined space not only acted as a preservative but also lent a special flavor to the meat then ploughing fencing sowing and planting followed in quick succession no hands could be spared the children must drive the cows to and from pasture they must also take a hand at churning it was a weary task i well remember to stand perhaps for an hour and drive the dasher up and down through the thick cream how often did we examine the handle for evidence that the butter was forming and what was the relief when the monotonous task was at an end as soon as my legs were long enough i had to follow a team indeed i drove the horses mounted on the back of one of them when my nether limbs were scarcely sufficiently grown to give me a grip the instruments for the agricultural operations were few and rough iron ploughs with cast-iron mould boards and shares were commonly employed compared with our modern ploughs they were clumsy things but a vast improvement on the earlier wooden ploughs which even at that date had not wholly gone out of use for drags treetops were frequently used in june came sheep washing the sheep were driven to the bay shore and secured in a pen one by one they were taken out and the fleeces carefully washed within a day or two shearing followed in the barn the wool was sorted some was reserved to be carted by hand the remainder was sent to the mills to be turned into rolls then day after day for weeks the noise of the spinning wheel was heard accompanied by the steady beat of the girl's feet as they walked forward and backward drawing out and twisting the thread and running it on the spindle this was work that required some skill for on the fineness and evenness of the thread the character of the fabric largely depended finally the yarn was carried to the weavers to be converted into cloth the women of the family found their hands very full in the thirties besides the daily round of housewifely cares every season brought its special duties there were wild strawberries and raspberries to be picked and prepared for daily consumption or to be preserved for winter use besides milking there was the making both of butter and cheese there was no nurse to take care of the children no cook to prepare the dinner to be sure in households when the work was beyond the powers of the family the daughter of some neighbor might come as a helper though hired she was treated in all respects as one of the family 
and in return was likely to take the same sort of interest in the work as if the tie that bound her to the family was closer than wages in truth such help was regarded as a favor and not as in any way affecting the girl's social position the girls in those days were more at home in a kitchen than a drawing-room they did better execution at a tub than at a spinet and could handle a rolling-pin more satisfactorily than a sketch-book at a pinch they could even use a rake or fork to good purpose in field or barn their finishing education was received at the country school along with their brothers of fashion-books and milliners few of them had any experiences country life in canada was plodding in the thirties and there was no varied outlook the girls training for future life was mainly at the hands of their mothers the boys followed in the footsteps of their fathers neither sex felt that life was cramped or burdensome on that account they were content to live as their parents had done and though we can see that as compared with later conditions there may be something wanting in such an existence this at least we know that in such a school and by such masters the foundations of canadian character and prosperity were laid caniff hate country life in canada in the thirties adapted he who knows most grieves most for wasted time dante end of chapter thirty five Chapter thirty six of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book Recorded for Librivox org by Anne Fletcher Heat by Archibald Lampman From plains that reel to southward dim, the road runs by me white and bare. Up the steep hill it seemed to swim beyond and melt into the glare. Upward half way, or it may be nearer the summit slowly steals a hay-cart moving dustily with idly clacking wheels by his cart's side the wagoner is slouching slowly at his ease half hidden in the windless blur of white dust puffing to his knees this wagon on the height above from sky to sky on either hand is the sole thing that seems to move in all the heat-held land Beyond me in the fields, the sun soaks in the grass and hath his will. I count the marguerites one by one. Even the buttercups are still. On the brook yonder, not a breath disturbs the spider or the midge. The water bugs draw close beneath the cool gloom of the bridge. Where the far elm tree shadows flood dark patches in the burning grass, the cows, each with her peaceful cud, lie waiting for the heat to pass. From somewhere on the slope nearby, into the pale depths of the noon, a wandering thrush slides leisurely his thin revolving tune. In intervals of dreams I hear the cricket from the droughty ground. The grasshoppers spin into mine ear a small, innumerable sound. I lift mine eyes sometimes to gaze. The burning skyline blinds my sight. The woods far off are blue with haze. The hills are drenched in light. And yet, to me, not this or that is always sharp or always sweet. In the sloped shadow of my hat, I lean at rest and drain the heat. Nay, more. I think some blessed power hath brought me wandering idly here. In the full furnace of this hour, my thoughts grow keen and clear. End of chapter 36 This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37 of the Ontario Readers, Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson The Two Paths Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in paths of uprightness. 
when thou goest thy steps shall not be straightened and if thou runnest thou shalt not stumble take fast hold of instruction let her not go keep her for she is thy life enter not into the path of the wicked and walk not in the way of evil men avoid it pass not by it turn from it and pass on for they sleep not except they have done mischief and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall for they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence but the path of the righteous is as the light of dawn that shineth more and more unto the perfect day the way of the wicked is as darkness they know not at what they stumble proverbs four end of chapter thirty seven this recording is in the public domain chapter thirty eight of the ontario readers fourth book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ellery davidson bernardo del carpio the spanish champion bernardo del carpio having made many ineffectual efforts to procure the release of his father the count saldana who had been imprisoned by king alfonso at last took up arms the war proved so destructive that the people demanded of the king saldana's liberty alfonso offered bernardo possession of his father's person in exchange for his castle bernardo accepted the offer gave up his castle and rode forth with the king to meet his father the warrior bowed his crested head and tamed his heart of fire and sued the haughty king to fring his long imprisoned sire i bring thee here my fortress keys i bring my captive train i pledge thee faith my liege my lord oh break my father's chain rise rise even now thy father comes a ransomed man this day mount thy good horse and thou and i will meet him on his way then lightly rose that loyal son and bounded on his steed and urged as if with lance in rest the charger's foamy speed and lo from far as on they pressed there came a glittering band with one that midst them stately rode as a leader in the land now haste bernardo haste for there in very truth is he thy father whom thy faithful heart hath yearned so long to see his dark eye flashed his proud breast heaved his cheeks blood came and went he reached that gray-haired chieftain side and there dismounting bent a lowly knee to earth he bent his father's hand he took what was there in its touch that all his fiery spirit shook that hand was cold a frozen thing it dropped from his like lead he looked up to the face above the face was of the dead a plume waved o'er the noble brow the brow was fixed and white he met at last his father's eyes but in them was no sight up from the ground he sprang and gazed but who could paint that gaze they hushed their very hearts that saw its horror and amaze they might have chained him as before that stony form he stood for the power was stricken from his arm and from his lip the blood father at length he murmured low and wept like childhood then talk not of grief till thou hast seen the tears of warlike men he thought on all his glorious hopes and all his young renown he flung the falchion from his side and in the dust sat down then covering with his steel-gloved hands his darkly mournful brow no more there is no more he said to lift the sword for now my king is false my hope betrayed my father oh the worth the glory and the loveliness are passed away from earth i thought to stand where banners waved my sire beside thee yet i would that there our kindred blood on spain's free soil had met thou wouldst have known my spirit then for thee my fields were won and thou hast perished in thy chains as though thou hadst no son then starting from the ground once more he seized the monarch's rein amidst the pale and wildered looks of all the courtier train and with a fierce o'ermastering grasp the rearing war-horse led and sternly set them face to face the king before the dead 
came i not forth upon thy pledge my father's hand to kiss be still and gaze thou on false king and tell me what is this the voice the glance the heart i sought give answer where are they if thou wouldst clear thy perjured soul send life through this cold clay into these glassy eyes put light be still keep down thine ire bid these white lips a blessing speak this earth is not my sire give me back him for whom i strove for whom my blood was shed thou canst not and a king his dust be mountains on thy head he loosed the steed his slack hand fell upon the silent face he cast one long deep troubled look then turned from that sad place his hope was crushed his after fate untold in martial strain his banner led the spears no more amidst the hills of spain felicia hemans to thine own self be true and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man shakespeare end of chapter thirty eight section thirty nine of the ontario readers fourth book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rosalind walsh newfoundland and labrador canada the ontario readers fourth book by various section thirty nine moses bargains my second boy moses whom i designed for business says the vicar received a sort of miscellaneous education at home as we were now to hold up our heads a little higher in the world it would be proper to sell the colt which was grown old at a neighbouring fair and buy us a horse that would carry single or double upon an occasion and make a pretty appearance at church or upon a visit this at first i opposed stoutly but it was as stoutly defended however as i weakened my antagonist gained strength till at last it was resolved to part with him as the fair happened on the following day i had intentions of going myself but my wife persuaded me that i had got a cold and nothing could prevail upon her to permit me from home no my dear said she our son moses is a discreet boy and can buy and sell to very good advantage you know all our great bargains are of his purchasing he always stands out and higgles and actually tires them till he gets a bargain as i had some opinion of my son's prudence i was willing enough to entrust him with this commission and the next morning i perceived his sisters mighty busy in fitting out moses for the fair trimming his hair brushing his buckles and cocking his hat with pins the business of the toilet being over we had at last the satisfaction of seeing him mounted upon the colt with a deal box before him to bring home groceries in he had on a coat made of that cloth they call thunder and lightning which though grown too short was much too good to be thrown away his waistcoat was of gosling green and his sisters had tied his hair with a broad black ribbon we all followed him several paces from the door bawling after him good luck good luck till we could see him no longer as night came on i began to wonder what could keep our son so long at the fair never mind our son cried my wife depend upon it he knows what he is about i'll warrant we'll never see him sell his hen of a rainy day i have seen him buy such bargains as would amaze one i'll tell you a good story about that that will make you split your sides with laughing but as i live yonder comes moses without a horse and the box at his back as she spoke moses came slowly on foot and sweating under the deal box which he had strapped round his shoulders like a peddler welcome welcome moses well my boy what have you brought us from the fair i have brought you myself cried moses with a sly look and resting the box on the dresser ah moses cried my wife that we know but where is the horse i have sold him cried moses for three pounds five shillings and twopence well done my good boy returned she i knew you would touch them off between ourselves three pounds five shillings and twopence 
is no bad day's work. Come, let us have it then. I have brought back no money, cried Moses again. I have laid it all out in a bargain, and here it is, pulling out a bundle from his breast. Here they are, a gross of green spectacles, with silver rims and shagreen cases. A gross of green spectacles, repeated my wife in a faint voice, and you have parted with the colt and brought us back nothing but a gross of green paltry spectacles? Dear mother, cried the boy, why won't you listen to reason? I had them a dead bargain, or I should not have bought them. The silver rims will sell for double the money. A fig for the silver rims, cried my wife in a passion. I dare swear they won't sell for above half the money at the rate of broken silver, five shillings an ounce. You need be under no uneasiness, cried I, about selling the rims, for they are not worth sixpence, for I perceive they are only copper varnished over. What, cried my wife, not silver, the rims not silver? No, cried I, no more silver than your saucepan. And so, returned she, we have parted with the colt, and have only got a gross of green spectacles, with copper rims and shea green cases. A murrain take such trumpery. The blockhead has been imposed upon, and should have known his company better. There, my dear, cried I, you are wrong. He should not have known them at all. Mary, hang the idiot, returned she, to bring me such stuff. If I had them, I would throw them into the fire. There again you are wrong, my dear, cried I, for though they be copper, we will keep them by us, as copper spectacles, you know, are better than nothing. By this time the unfortunate Moses was undeceived. He now saw that he had been imposed upon by a prowling sharper, who, observing his figure, had marked him for an easy prey. I therefore asked the circumstances of his deception. He sold the horse, it seems, and walked the fair in search of another. A reverend-looking man brought him to a tent under pretense of having one to sell. Here, continued Moses, we met another man, very well dressed, who desired to borrow twenty pounds upon these, saying that he wanted money, and would dispose of them for a third of the value. The first gentleman, who pretended to be my friend, whispered me to buy them, and cautioned me not to let so good an offer pass. I sent for Mr. Flamborough, and they talked him up as finely as they did me, and so at last we were persuaded to buy the two gross between us. Goldsmith, the Vicar of Wakefield End of Section 39「Chapter Forty of the Ontario Readers, Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abby. The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book by Various. Chapter Forty The Maple. O oh, tenderly deepen the woodland glooms, and merrily sway the beeches. Breathe delicately the willow blooms, and the pines rehearse new speeches. The elms toss high till they reach the sky, pale catkins the yellow birch launches. But the tree I love, all the greenwood above, is the maple of sunny branches. Let who will sing of the hawthorn in spring? or the late-leaved linden in summer. There's a word may be for the locust tree, that delicate, strange newcomer. But the maple it glows with the tint of rose, when pale are the springtime regions. And its towers of flame from afar proclaim the advance of winter's legions. And a greener shade there never was made than its summer canopy sifted, and many a day, as beneath it I lay, my memory backward drifted, to a pleasant lane I may walk not again, leading over fresh green hill, where a maple stood just clear of the wood, and oh, to be near it still. Charles G. D. Roberts End of chapter 40
Section 41 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada The Greenwood Tree Under the greenwood tree, who loves to lie with me, And tune his merry note unto the sweet bird's throat, Come hither, come hither, come hither, Here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather who doth ambition shun and loves to live i the sun seeking the food he eats and please with what he gets come hither come hither come hither here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather shakespeare believe me thrift of time will repay you in after life with a usury of profit beyond your most sanguine dreams and the waste of it will make you dwindle alike in intellectual and moral stature beyond your darkest reckonings gladstone end of section forty one this recording is in the public domain chapter forty two of the ontario readers fourth book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Lake Superior Before turning our steps westward from this inland ocean, Lake Superior, it will be well to pause a moment on its shore and look out over its bosom. It is worth looking at, for the world possesses not its equal. Four hundred English miles in length, one hundred and fifty miles in breadth, six hundred feet above Atlantic level, nine hundred feet in depth, one vast spring of purest crystal water so cold that during summer months its waters are like ice itself and so clear that hundreds of feet below the surface the rocks stand out as distinctly as those seen through plate glass follow in fancy the outpourings of this wonderful basin seek its future course in huron erie and ontario in that wild leap from the rocky ledge which makes niagara famous through the world seek it farther still in the quiet loveliness of the thousand isles in the whirl and sweep of the cedar rapids in the silent rush of the great current under the rocks at the foot of quebec ay and even farther away still down where the lone laurentian hills come forth to look again upon that water whose earliest beginnings they cradled along the shores of lake superior there close to the sounding billows of the atlantic two thousand miles from superior these hills the only ones that ever last guard the great gate by which the st lawrence seeks the sea there are rivers whose currents running red with the silt and mud of their soft alluvial shores carry far into the ocean the record of their muddy progress but this glorious river system through its many lakes and various names is ever the same crystal current flowing pure from the fountain-head of lake superior great cities stud its shores but they are powerless to dim the transparency of its waters steamships cover the broad bosom of its lakes and estuaries but they change not the beauty of the water no more than the fleets of the world mark the waves of the ocean any person looking at a map of the region bounding the great lakes of north america will be struck by the absence of rivers flowing into lakes superior michigan or huron from the south in fact the drainage of the states bordering these lakes on the south is altogether carried off by the valley of the mississippi it follows that this valley of the mississippi is at a much lower level than the surface of the lakes these lakes containing an area of some seventy three thousand square miles are therefore an immense reservoir held high over the level of the great mississippi valley from which they are separated by a barrier of slight elevation and extent major w f butler the great lone land end of chapter forty two this recording is in the public domain Chapter forty three of the Ontario Readers Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Betty B. The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book by Various. The Red River Plain. The plain through which Red River flows is fertile beyond description. At a little distance, it seems one vast level plain through which the windings of the river are marked by a dark line of woods fringing the whole length of the stream each tributary has also its line of forest a line visible many miles away over the great sea of grass as one travels on there first rise above the prairie the tops of the trees these gradually grow larger until finally after many hours the river is reached nothing else breaks the uniform level standing upon the ground the eye ranges over many miles of grass standing on a wagon one doubles the area of vision and to look over the plains from an elevation of twelve feet above the earth is to survey at a glance a space so vast that distance alone seems to bound its limits the effect of sunset over these oceans of verdure is very beautiful a thousand hues spread themselves upon the grassy plains a thousand tints of gold are cast along the heavens and the two oceans of the sky and of the earth intermingle in one great blaze of glory at the very gates of the setting sun but to speak of sunsets now is only to anticipate here at the red river we are only at the threshold of the sunset its true home lies yet many days journey to the west there where the long shadows of the vast herds of bison used to trail slowly over the immense plains huge and dark against the golden west there where the red man still sees in the glory of the setting sun the realization of his dream of heaven major w f butler the great lone land as every action is capable of a peculiar dignity in the manner of it so also it is capable of dignity still higher in the motive of it there is no action so slight nor so mean but it may be done to a great purpose and ennobled therefore nor is any purpose so great but that slight actions may help it and may be so done as to help it much most especially that chief of all purposes the pleasing of god ruskin end of chapter forty three Chapter forty four of the Ontario Readers Fourth Book Recorded for Librivox dot org by Alethea The Unnamed Lake It sleeps among the thousand hills where no man ever trod, and only nature's music fills the silences of God. Great mountains tower above its shore, green rushes fringe its brim, and o'er its breast for evermore the wanton breezes skim dark clouds that intercept the sun go there in spring to weep and there when autumn days are done white mists lie down to sleep sunrise and sunset crown with gold the peaks of ageless stone where winds have thundered from of old and storms have set their throne no echoes of the world afar disturb it night or day but sun and shadow moon and star pass and repass for a twas in the grey of early dawn when first the lake we spied and fragments of a cloud were drawn half down the mountain side along the shore a heron flew and from a speck on high that hovered in the deepening blue we heard the fishhawks cry among the cloud-capped solitudes no sound the silence broke save when in whispers down the woods the guardian mountain spoke through tangled brush and dewy brake returning whence we came we passed in silence and the lake we left without a name f g scott we are not sent into this world to do anything into which we cannot put our hearts we have certain work to do for our bread and that is to be done strenuously other work to do for our delight and that is to be done heartily neither is to be done by halves or shifts but with a will ruskin 
End of chapter 44. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 45 of The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book, by Various. Chapter 45 Life in Norman England. The tall, frowning keep and solid walls of the great stone castles in which the norman barons lived betokened an age of violence and suspicion beauty gave way to the needs of safety girdled with a green and slimy ditch round the inner side of which ran a parapeted wall pierced along the top with shot holes stood the buildings spreading often over many acres if an enemy managed to cross the moat and force the gateway in spite of a portcullis crashing from above and melted lead pouring in burning streams from the perforated top of the rounded arch but little of his work was yet done for the keep lifted its huge angular block of masonry within the inner bailey or courtyard and from the narrow chinks in its ten-foot wall rained a sharp incessant shower of arrows sweeping all approaches to the high and narrow stair by which alone access could be had to its interior these loopholes were the only windows except in the topmost story where the chieftain like a vulture in his rocky nest watched all the surrounding country the day of splendid aureoles had not yet come in castle architecture thus a baron in his keep could defy and often did defy the king upon his throne under his roof eating daily at his board lived a throng of armed retainers and around his castle lay farms tilled by marshal franklins who at his call laid aside their implements of husbandry took up the sword and spear which they could wield with equal skill and marched beneath his banner to the war the furniture of a norman keep was not unlike that of an english house there was richer ornament more elaborate carving a folderstole the original of our armchair spread its drapery and cushions for the chieftain in his lounging moods his bed now boasted curtains and a roof although like the english lord he still lay only upon straw chimneys tunnelled the thick walls and the cupboards glittered with glass and silver horn lanterns and the old spiked candlesticks lit up his evening hours when the chessboard arrayed its clumsy men carved out of walrus tusk then commonly called whalesbone but the baron had an unpleasant trick of breaking the chessboard on his opponent's head when he found himself checkmated which somewhat marred that player's enjoyment of the game dice of horn and bone emptied many a purse in norman england draughts were also sometimes played dance and music whiled away the long winter nights and on summer evenings the castle courtyards resounded with the noise of football wrestling boxing leaping and the fierce joys of the bull bait but out of doors when no fighting was on hand the hound the hawk and the lance attracted the best energies and skill of the norman gentleman the normans probably dined at nine in the morning when they rose they took a light meal and ate something also after their day's work immediately before going to bed goose and garlic formed a favourite dish their cookery was more elaborate and in comparison more delicate than the preparations for an english feast but the character for temperance which they brought with them from the continent soon vanished the poorer classes hardly ever ate flesh living principally on bread butter and cheese a fact in social life which seems to underlie that usage of our tongue by which the living animals in field or stall bore english names ox sheep calf pig 
dear while their flesh promoted to norman dishes rejoiced in names of french origin beef mutton veal pork venison round cakes piously marked with a cross piled the tables on which pastry of various kinds also appeared in good houses cups of glass held the wine which was borne from the cellar below in jugs squatted around the door or on the stairs leading to the norman dining hall which was often on an upper floor was a crowd of beggars or gluttons who grew so insolent in the days of rufus that ushers armed with rods were posted outside to beat back the noisy throng who thought little of snatching the dishes as the cooks carried them to table the juggler who under the normans filled the place of the english gleeman tumbled sang and balanced knives in the hall or out in the bailey of an afternoon displayed the acquirements of his trained monkey or bear the fool too clad in coloured patchwork cracked his ribald jests and shook his cap and bells at the elbow of roaring barons when the board was spread and the circling of the wine began monasteries served many useful purposes at this time besides their manifest value as centres of study and literary work they gave alms to the poor a supper and a bed to travellers their tenants were better off and better treated than the tenants of the nobles the monks could store grain grow apples and cultivate their flower beds with little risk of injury from war because they had spiritual penalties at their call which usually awed even the most reckless of the soldiery into a respect for sacred property as schools too the monasteries did no trifling service to society in the middle ages in addition to their influence as great centres of learning english law had enjoined every mass priest to keep a school in his parish church where all the young committed to his care might be instructed the youth of the middle classes destined for the cloister or the merchant stall chiefly thronged these schools the aristocracy cared little for book learning very few indeed of the barons could read or write but all could ride fence tilt play at cards and carve extremely well for to these accomplishments many years of pagehood and squirehood were given w f collier adapted self-reverence self-knowledge self-control these three alone lead life to sovereign power tennyson End of chapter 45。Chapter 46 of the Ontario Readers Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox.org Ye Mariners of England Ye Mariners of England that guard our native seas, whose flag has braved a thousand years the battle and the breeze your glorious standard launch again to match another foe and sweep through the deep while the stormy winds do blow while the battle rages loud and long and the stormy winds do blow the spirits of your fathers shall start from every wave for the deck it was their field of fame and ocean was their grave where blake and mighty nelson fell your manly hearts shall glow as ye sweep through the deep while the stormy winds do blow while the battle rages loud and long and the stormy winds do blow britannia needs no bulwarks no towers along the steep her march is o'er the mountain waves her home is on the deep with thunders from her native oak she quells the floods below as they roar on the shore when the stormy winds do blow when the battle rages loud and long 
and the stormy winds do blow the meteor flag of england shall yet terrific burn till danger's troubled night depart and the star of peace return then then ye ocean warriors our song and feast shall flow to the fame of your name when the storm has ceased to blow when the fiery fight is heard no more and the storm has ceased to blow by thomas campbell it is the land that freemen till that sober suited freedom chose the land where girt with friends or foes a man may speak the thing he will a land of settled government a land of old and just renown where freedom broadens slowly down from precedent to precedent by tennyson end of chapter 46 this recording is in the public domain chapter 47 of the ontario readers fourth book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Instruction Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom and with all thy getting get understanding exalt her and she shall promote thee she shall bring thee to honour when thou dost embrace her she shall give to thine head an ornament of grace a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee my son attend to my words incline thy ear unto my sayings let them not depart from thine eyes keep them in the midst of thine heart for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left remove thy foot from evil proverbs four end of chapter forty seven this recording is in the public domain section forty eight of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox dot org by rosalind walsh newfoundland and labrador canada home thoughts from abroad o oh, to be in england now that april's there and whoever wakes in england sees some morning unaware that the lowest boughs and the brushwood's sheaf round the elm tree bowl are in tiny leaf while the chaffinch sings on the orchard bough in england now and after april when may follows and the white throat builds and all the swallows hark where my blossomed pear tree in the hedge leans to the field and scatters on the clover blossoms and dewdrops at the bent spray's edge that's the wise thrush he sings each song twice over lest you should think he never could recapture the first fine careless rapture and though the fields look rough with hoary dew all will be gay when noontide wakes anew the buttercups the little children's dower far brighter than this gaudy melon flower browning end of section forty eight this recording is in the public domain chapter forty nine of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox dot org by betty b the bells of shandon with deep affection and recollection i often think of those shandon bells whose sound so wild would in the days of childhood fling round my cradle their magic spells on this i ponder wherever i wander 
and thus grow fonder sweet cork of thee with thy bells of shandon that sound so grand on the pleasant waters of the river lee i've heard bells chiming full many a climb in tolling sublime in cathedral shrine while at a glib rate brass tongues would vibrate but all their music spoke not like thine for memory dwelling on each proud swelling of thy belfry knelling its bold notes free may the bells of shandon sound far more grand on the pleasant waters of the river lee i've heard bells tolling old adrian's mole in their thunder rolling from the vatican and cymbals glorious swinging uproarious in the gorgeous turrets of notre dame but thy sounds were sweeter than the dome of peter flings o'er the tiber pealing solemnly oh the bells of shandon sound far more grand on the pleasant waters of the river lee there's a bell in moscow while on tower and kiosk o in saint sophia the turkman gets and loud in air calls men to prayer from the tapering summits of tall minarets such empty phantom i freely grant them but there's an anthem more dear to me tis the bells of shandon that sound so grand on the pleasant waters of the river lee francis mahoney the man whom i call worthy of the name is one whose thoughts and exertions are for others rather than for himself whose high purpose is adopted on just principles and is never abandoned while heaven or earth affords means of accomplishing it he is one who will neither seek an indirect advantage by a specious road nor take an evil path to secure a really good purpose scott End of chapter 49. This recording is in the public domain.